the first question for you is how would you define high performance um i think high performance is more of a feeling than an accomplishment right um i think high performance is being in flow um when i feel like i'm performing well i'm actually having fun um you know no matter how difficult the work is no matter how stressed i am um even if i work late at the end of whatever i'm doing that day i'll walk and go that was fun um and so for me high performance is probably this intersection where you like the thing that you're enjoying and the thing that and you're being productive sort of collide um yeah i think it's more of a feeling than it is a a, a calculation so what are the things that get you there um well as i said you know fun is a big part of it for me and and the way that i i make sure that it is fun is that there's a context for everything um so i'm very very purpose driven cause driven um, i have a vision of a world um that does not yet exist a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired feel safe wherever they are and end the day fulfilled by the work that they do and as long as whatever i'm doing is moving towards that and i don't even care what it is um uh whatever no whatever i'm doing is working towards that and i can i can either feel or measure that i'm working towards that then i will much more easily find myself in that state so for example if i know something doesn't so let me give you an example like if some company calls me and says we'll offer you a ton of money to come and speak to our top 30 sales people at a company that i don't really respect that their culture is something that i wouldn't write about but they just offer me a ton of money you know to go do it i i will turn it down because the feeling of being there will feel like work whereas when i get offered to go somewhere where pays a lot less but what they tell me that their company does or the way that they lead their people i find interesting i find inspiring i actually want to learn from them and then showing up with them and the conversations i have with them and the the feeling that i get that i'm contributing to whatever it is they're doing that that brings me tremendous uh, joy and flow so it's it's really about having a filter and using it i think a lot of people talk about cause and purpose but they use it as a punchline you know it's copy on a web on a website um and and if you're too metric driven you'll um it'll it's much harder to get that feeling um because um metrics don't produce that feeling ever i wonder though whether those sort of three key principles of how you would love to see the world whether you could get there even quicker if you went into these businesses that didn't understand the way you think or didn't have these values and oh. almost open their eyes oh, to oh, oh, what what they could be oh yeah make no mistake i don't just preach to the converted yeah <laughs> i mean my team knows i call it belly of the beast which is i will say yes to things where i know that they don't um you know i'll go into a a big bank that i think has done damage and i will i will show up as a preacher for sure but then i have to have scale right so the example i gave was 30 of our top sales people i'm not moving any needles that day right but if you say it's the top 30 ceos from the biggest you know whatever venture capitalist firms and banks whatever oh yeah yeah i'm going to do that but i'm coming with a different agenda you know i'm coming there to preach so i've worked with many dysfunctional broken companies the difference is is there's at least a few people a few executives who know that change has to happen and they welcome my message when when i go in there in other words there's hope I, i'm i'm not going to go preach to a brick wall you know there's literally no point there has to be at least somebody in there who 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 has interest um which is a pretty easy thing to gauge there's a famous saying then that all progress depends upon the unreasonable man so when you go into these environments where you where you're preaching these messages how do you cope with the idea that sometimes it isn't what they want to hear well i i don't think they're going to invite me you know i mean those who those who know my if they're inviting me it's, somebody has at least told them that this is going to happen and it's happened a few times where they didn't do their homework you know maybe they just you know somebody said you should get get this guy and they did and i remember there was a company a bunch of years ago and i'll leave out the names to protect the to protect the guilty um but the cfo came he was i was in waiting in the green room waiting to go out and he came into the green room and said listen i have a favor to ask you know don't talk about layoffs i said 
why not? He goes, well, we're planning on having a round in a couple of weeks, and I don't want you to talk about that that's bad for business. I said, but it is bad for business. It's bad for a corporate culture. He goes, yeah, no, but don't talk about it. I said, well, I'm not going to not talk about it. Like, I'm not going to, I won't bring it up. I'm not going to be spiteful, and I'm not going to stab you with it. But if it comes up, I'm going to talk about it. He goes, no, no, I know, but I'd really appreciate it if you didn't talk about it. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to make that promise. So that has happened a couple of times. But again, I think most people, I've got enough work out there that if I'm, they know that I'll always speak my mind. And if they're afraid of that, I did have somebody cancel on me once. It was a big brand who I had a, a meeting with the, the senior executives before I went to visit them. And um, we had a very honest conversation. They uninvited me. Because the reason, <laughs> I, because the reason I asked the question, Simon, is that... Please uh, name them. <laughs> yeah. The reason I ask you is because there will be people that are almost advocates for your message sure. that are in those organizations that want to get the message across. Yes. And sometimes you can be the messenger that delivers it to a certain level of leadership. Yes. So I suppose my question is more aimed at what advice or tips or techniques could you offer for those people that are in the belly of the beast yeah. that are trying to make it happen yeah. without having the platform that you do? So um, one of the mistakes that people make, and and by the way, folks in my position as well make this mistake, the well-intended insiders who want to affect change, um, they they come guns a-blazing. You know, they get the chance to talk to the executive, and it starts off with sometimes the words, but at least the mentality of, let me tell you what's wrong, or let me tell you how to fix this thing. And, um, uh, and nobody wants to hear that. Like, can you imagine if I sat down and said, can I just tell you how to make your podcast better? Can I just spend 10 minutes and like tell you what's wrong with your podcast? I mean, I, I haven't even said anything already. You're shutting down, right? <laughs> like, you're like, no, don't tell us that. Right. Um, but if I talk about vision and I talk about where I want to go um, and I talk about the world that I imagine I think a lot of it is language and uh, it has to start with curiosity you know um, can I talk to you about some of the things that you are imagining for this company you know what do you envision for this company and if somebody shows curiosity for the ideas of somebody else then and only then are they open to your ideas um, only if you show interest and give somebody, if, if, if you make somebody else feel seen and heard and understood, then they want to return the favor by making you feel seen and heard and understood. So very often, I don't actually think it's the point of view. I think it's the way in which we present the point of view to those in power. Almost always. I saw it play out recently in front of, in front of me. Very senior executive went up to his boss and basically said, let me tell you what's broken and what's wrong. And I saw his boss just shut down. Um, as opposed to going up to him and be like, hey, how, you, how are you? It's been a stressful few weeks. I just want to check in and see that you're okay. You know, so it's, it's I, and I pride myself on that. I think that was the coup of Start With Why, to be honest. I'm not the first person to talk about purpose at work. But back when I started talking about the why, if you talked about purpose at work, you were some weirdo hippie. You know, and so talking about purpose at work, you're literally only preaching to the converted, this very small group of people who believed in it. And the coup of start with why um, was the language, which is I found a, a neutral language that made those who needed to hear the message, hear the message. It also was new language that those that were struggling to tell their bosses now had new language. And I got that in the early days of Start With Why. The number of people who came up to me and said, thank you, you've given me language that, have, that is helping me tell them the thing I've been trying to tell them for years. So the, once again, it goes back to, to language. So let's talk about why then. Yeah. It's the global bestseller. Many, many copies around the world mm -hmm. have been and continue to be and will continue to be sold. But I'm also sure there might be a few people listening to this that are thinking, hang on a minute, We'll start with why, what's that about? Or even people who maybe have heard of the book or might have read some of the book but would love to hear more from you about it. So could you explain the concept of start with why for the uninitiated? So very simply, um, every single one of us knows what we do. The products we sell, the services we offer, the jobs we perform. Yeah. Um, some of us know how we do what we do, the things that we think make us stand out or distinguish us from others who do similar things to us. But very, very few of us can clearly articulate why we do what we do. I don't mean to make money. Um, 
I mean, what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why did you get out of bed this morning? Why does your organization exist? And why should anybody care? And what I learned is that the great leaders, the most inspiring leaders, everybody from uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Steve Jobs, you know, all these great leaders, um, these inspiring leaders, every single one of them thinks, acts, and communicates the exact same way. And it's the complete opposite to the rest of us, where we start telling people what we do, they start telling you what they believe. And what they do simply serves as tangible proof of what they believe. And the magical thing about this little idea is it's not my opinion. It's based on the biology of how the human brain makes decisions. Go on, tell us more about that. Um, so the human brain, the the there's a part of the brain called the neocortex, which is our homo sapien brain. It's the newest part of our brain. It's responsible for all of our rational thoughts and language. It's just not responsible for decisions. This is where the what exists, right? It's very rational, easy to see, tangible. The limbic part of our brain is responsible for all of our feelings, like trust and loyalty. This is where gut decisions come from. It's also responsible for all of our behavior, but it has no capacity for language, which is why it's hard to put feelings into words. This is why we use analogies and metaphors all the time. Um, and so when we start with why, you're actually talking to the decision-making part of the brain. That's why it feels inspiring. Um, uh, this is why you light up or get goosebumps when you hear those kinds of messages or feel like somebody's talking directly to you, um, as opposed to describing a product which you can understand and it's all very rational. Um, and most people lead with the rational. They're trying to make a tangible or, or a rational case why you should or shouldn't do something or buy or not buy something. Uh, the great leaders inspire us to buy. And again, it's just the biology. So I love that point you make about how, like, the neutrality of a language. It, mm. it's a, there's a phrase that I heard an educationalist talk about, of language that is psychologically privileged, that you can get ideas in. Mm. So if... There's somebody listening to this that maybe wants to start exploring their why. Mm. What's the kind of language or the questions that they should be they should be asking that sort of open up these kind of conversations for themselves well, to learn their own why? Or well, first for themselves, but also well, let's talk about for themselves initially, and then maybe talk about how they can do it with teams that they're part of. Sure. So um, to do it for someone's for yourself to learn your own why. Um, First of all, understand that a why is basically an origin story. It's where you come from. We are the products of our upbringing. You know, the experiences you had growing up make you who you are, make me who I am. Your why is fully formed by your mid to late teens, and it doesn't change for the rest of your life. You have only one why. You are who you are. Now, whether you're living in balance with that is a different conversation. Whether you're making the decisions that are are of high end, uh, uh High authenticity, and that's all that authenticity means. Authenticity means the things that I say and the things that I do reflect who I actually am. That's all it means. Um, that's a different conversation. Um, and so when you know your why, the ability to make those choices becomes a lot easier. You know, we've all had the feeling of flow and things like this, except it's a little bit like a roulette game. Like sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. It's like I've done the same thing a thousand times. How come it doesn't feel good anymore? Um, so here's a fun way you can learn your why. Uh, it's called a friend's exercise. Go and find, do this with a best friend. You know, do not do this with a spouse. Do not do this with a sibling. Do not do this with a parent. It doesn't work. Best friend. Um, somebody who loves you, who will be there for you. They'll pick up the phone at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you would do the same for them. And ask them the simple question. Why are we friends? And they're going to look at you like you're nuts. Because the part of the brain that controls that deep feeling of love and trust doesn't control language. It's a difficult question to answer. And so they'll say... I don't know. <laughs> of course they know. They just don't have the words for it. And so you actually stop asking the question why, and you ask the question what. What specifically is it about me? Come on, what specifically is it about me that I know that you would be there for me no matter what? And they'll hem and they'll haw, and they'll struggle, and you can't help them, and you can't let anybody else help them. You have to let them go through the process. And they'll start describing you. I don't know. You're smart. You're loyal. I trust you. And you play devil's advocate. Good. That's the definition of a friend. You have that with lots of people. What specifically is it about me that I know you would be there for me no matter what? And again, they'll go through a few rounds of complaining and describing you. And eventually they'll quit and they'll start describing themselves. And this is what my friends said to me. They said, I don't know, Simon. All I know is that I can sit in a room with you. I don't even have to talk to you. And I feel inspired. And I got goosebumps. 
In fact, I'm getting them right now. It happens every time. Uh, because what they did is they put the value that I have in the world into words. And I had the emotional response. And that's what will happen. Somebody will say something that you will either get goosebumps or you'll well up or something will happen. And that's, the, that's when you know you, you're hit, you've hit it. Because the thing that you give to the world that you should be working to give to the world consistently is the reason those people love you. It's the reason why you're not friends with everyone. Um, and if you do this with multiple friends, the amazing thing is they will say very similar, if not the exact same thing, because that's the thing you give to the world. That is your why. It is the reason you get out of bed in the morning. Um, it's a really fun exercise. Um, with teams, it's slightly different. Um, but even for companies, a why is still an origin story. You know, where the company came from, the founder's story is is the why of the organization. Um, for teams, it's a little different. Um um, in those cases, you want to tell specific stories that reflect why we love coming to work every day, right? And by the way, you asked before, like, how do I communicate my why to other people? Um, just remember, I'm not smarter. I've just been doing this a lot longer. So I'm practiced, which is why I can sort of sort of wax off and wax on about a, about a vision or something like that. It's just because I've, I've, it's taken me many, many iterations to get it right. The easiest way to do it is... Um, is to simply say to somebody, let me tell you why I love working here. Not like, love. You know, like is rational. I like my job. I like the people. I get paid well. I like my job. Love is emotional. It's like, you know, I, you know, the question is like, do you love your wife? Yes, I like her a lot. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a different standard, <laughs> right? Yeah. right? Love is a higher standard. So when you talk about what you love, it's, it's profoundly different. I'll give you a silly example, actually one that comes from the book, which I haven't thought about in quite a long time. Um, t trying to communicate your ideas to someone, whether it's selling a product, selling yourself in an interview, or just in a meeting with people, just you, wanna, you want people to quote unquote buy your ideas, right? Um, it's the same as dating. I mean, think about it. You sit across a table from somebody and you hope to make the sale. You hope to make the deal, right? And that's what you want. So let's make a, a dating analogy. Let's take, um, let's call him Brian, right? And we send Brian out on a date um, and he sits down at the table with this girl that he was set up with. And this is how he starts the date. He goes, um, I'm incredibly rich. Um, I'm, I'm very successful. Um, I'm on TV a lot, which is great because uh, I'm quite good looking. I know a lot of famous people um, and I have a beautiful house. You should come by sometime. Now, the question is this how well did that date go? <laughs> Instinctively, we all know that was crap, right? But think about how people sell their ideas or how companies sell themselves. It's like, we're a very, very successful company. Um, you may have seen our advertising on, on TV. We're very, we're very good at what we do. We have beautiful offices. You should come by and see them sometime. Well, if we know the date was crap, why would we think that that would work any better? The answer is, it doesn't, right? Um, now let's send, send Brian back out again. Um, and this time we'll arm him with his why. And we'll say he doesn't know his why, but he can answer specific questions about love, yeah. right? He can give specific examples. So he sits down again and he says, you know, I absolutely love my work. Um, just the other day, just, just three days ago, um, one of my team members was struggling and I just, I had the opportunity to like, I was walking down the hall and I was, in a, I was late for a meeting, but I thought, you know what, this is more important to me. And I sat down with them and like helped them figure out a problem. And then, then I just went to my meeting and showed up late. And when I explained why I was late, everybody said, yeah, 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 of course you did the right thing. And I got to tell you, it is the most magical thing in the world to come to work every day in a place where I get to do that and it's so appreciated. And the best thing about it was I made a lot of money because of it and I got to meet a lot of famous people. I get to go on TV all the time, which is really great because I'm good looking. And, and I, got to, I got to buy a beautiful house. You should come by sometime. Like all the same rational stuff is there, but how different did that feel, yeah. right? And so now the rational stuff is the proof, but it's not the reason to buy. So if you can tell a specific story of what you love, and it's a high bar, you have to love it. Um, it's a way to attract people who love the same thing. And the best thing about it is it's a filter. Because there are some people listening to that story and think, that's cheesy. We're not going to do well together in business. So it's a fantastic filter that it attracts the right people and it repels the wrong people. Brilliant. 
I've got a lot of things running through my head, right? right? The biggest one is this <clears throat> this fear that I'm not sure I'm going to be able to find my why. Now, at this point in the conversation, Simon offered to help me find my why. Here's a small example of what we discussed. You had that experience of sitting in the back of the car. Yeah. Your mum probably trying to keep your dad awake, you know. Was there something in particular about this one, or is that just one you found to try and capture the general the general memory um i think it was because my parents were really busy so my mm -hmm. dad used my dad was a charity worker but also was doing a degree while we were kids my mum was a full-time teacher mm -hmm. so there wasn't loads of like we weren't a family that did loads of stuff actually mum and dad were like they worked basically <clears throat> and then the weekends were a list of jobs saturday and sunday mm -hmm. and they're still like that even now in their 70s they just have you go in the house they have a list of jobs all the time mm -hmm. and i think it was just like that was gone and it was just we were just together at those moments so that's why that stands out far more than being at home really like i, I wouldn't really pick up on anything so it's the, the the joy of going on the adventure with the family yeah or maybe two people who are more adult than you yeah yeah kind of like the formula one example yes right so the, yeah, those stories too. are very very similar which is wasn't you standing by yourself in the pit lane right it was you said it was these two people that you're standing with you know, a race car driver and a and a multimillionaire team owner, you know, kind of like mum and dad, you know, a charity worker and a teacher who are highly qualified people. But in that moment, you're just a family and you're a part of that family. And you may be the youngest, least qualified person, but you're still a part of the family. Yeah. And uh, those, those two are exactly the same story, that incredible sense of like, oh, my God, like, this is it. I love this. I'm in the car with them. Yeah. You know, this is this is it. And everybody's relaxed and we're enjoying ourselves. And I'm I'm a part of this, you know, and they see me as equal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they didn't look down on me. And you said, I feel like I've arrived. You feel like I'm here. But it was also that they treated you that way. Yeah. You know, and so your why is very much your why is is very much about um, um, feeling a part of the family, feeling a part of the team. Um, and I would venture to say that you're at your happiest when you are working with people in common cause to do something together. And where you struggle is when you're asked to do things alone. And to hear that in full, download the High Performance app for free right now. And you can hear the full conversation as Simon guided me through finding my own why. Right, back to the conversation. So if we turn the lens onto yourself, mm. how did you come to discover your why then? So I um, it was I reached a point in my career where I had fallen out of love with my work. Um, superficially, my my life was good. You know, I owned my own business. We had amazing clients. We did amazing work. Doing what? What was? I had business? a marketing consultancy. Yeah. Um, in New York, and uh, I didn't want to wake up and do it anymore. I just was. I was done. And was that a sudden realization or a dawning one? I mean, you know. These things always feel sudden, but they've been, you know, that's a slow boiling frog until you realize the water's boiling. Um, so the answer is, who knows? It, it, it showed up, you know? Like, how long does it take to feel depressed? I, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I was deeply embarrassed, feeling bad, because I shouldn't. Look, look what I'm doing. Look at the things I'm getting to do. Like, I shouldn't be, you know, depressed or you know, not want to go to work. And so I kept it, all those negative feelings to myself, which really is stupid. Um, and the feelings got darker and darker and darker and they feed on each, they feed on themselves. And that's the problem with keeping negative feelings to yourself. They, they fester and grow. And it got to the point where I was in really a dark place, but all of my energy went into pretending that I was happier, more in control and more successful than I really felt. So nobody knew. Okay. Um, and uh, it wasn't until a very dear friend of mine came to me and said, there's something wrong. There's something different. I don't know what it is, but something's off. And I, for whatever reason, I, I opened up and came clean. And it was cathartic. You know, it was a weight lifted off my shoulders. And all of that energy that went into lying, hiding, and faking every day, I now had new energy, renewed energy to actually find a solution. Um, uh, I'll spare you the long, drawn-out story, but... I had already articulated this idea of the why and the golden circle to explain why some marketing worked and some marketing didn't. Okay. And it was the discovery of the human brain, the limbic brain and the neocortex, um, uh, which I learned at a dinner party. I was sitting next to somebody who their dad was a neuroscientist. I mean, it was just like polite conversation and like bells started 
going off. And I realized it didn't explain why marketing worked. It, just, it explained why people do what they do. And I realized this was my problem. I knew what I did. I knew how I did it, but I couldn't tell you why. That's what I needed to find. And I couldn't do it for myself. And so I brought in an outsider who had objectivity and took me through some sort of version of his his process and mine um, that really helped. But the more important thing was I figured out how to help my friends find their why. Sure. And that's what I started doing. I started helping my friends find their why. But there's an element of your story there, and thank you for sharing it, that I think takes courage to do that, whether it was that friend of yours that has just spotted that something is off with you to ask you that the courage to open up and be honest and be vulnerable with them is something that I, I think, think doesn't get referred to enough. Thank you, but I disagree. <laughs> because? I think my friend had the courage, not me. You know, um, I think it's really hard when your friends say to you there's something wrong and you go, no, everything's fine, and then they let it go. Or they're not even willing to say something's off. They just kind of, it's too uncomfortable. You know, we don't like discomfort. Discomfort. We certainly don't, don't like causing discomfort. And we certainly don't want to create tension or a fight. And so we just leave it. And I think the courageous friends, the friends who truly, truly, truly love you, are the ones who will lean into that tension and go, I don't care what you say. And I know you're lying to me. I love you to death. And I know something's wrong. And I'm going to keep asking you until you tell me. You know? And more importantly, whatever it is, I got you. I love you. You're safe. I don't know what it is and I don't care what it is. Just know that I'm your partner and you are never alone. And the friend who helped me, that became the way we said I love you to each other. Um, we used to say you're never alone because that's how it all started. You know, she said to me, you're not alone here. Um, so I think the, she had the courage to get me to open up, and then I just stepped into the, the safe space. So if we accept that courage was present... For sure. There. For sure. What, the, <laughs> I so, just won't take the credit. Yeah. No, and <laughs> that's very noble of you, but I think the reason I'm asking that is because for anyone listening to this, Simon, I, I'm interested in you articulating what are the benefits of being prepared to ask these questions that yeah. are often un, that go unanswered. Yeah, I mean, you know, human beings are, despite our own self-opinions, we're not that strong and we're not that smart. But in teams and groups, we're amazing. And so trying to solve your own life problems by yourself, I've got, a, I've got some really bad news. You can't, which is why addiction exists, because I can't solve these problems myself. I can't overcome the stress myself, so I'm going to drink. You know, or I'm going to do something else that's harmful to myself, my family, and my relationships, as all addictions are. Whether you're addicted to your cell phone, addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs, you're going to destroy your relationships. You're going to destroy yourself. Um, and there is tremendous value, and it does take courage, you're right, for somebody who loves you to say, I got you, I'm here, let's do this together. Or for you to call a friend and say, I, I think I'm struggling and and I think I can't do this alone. Can you help me? It's humiliating, but it is perhaps the single greatest lesson that any human being can learn, which is to say, I don't know and I need help. Um, and if you can learn that, um, and you can do it in the worst of times, you can do it all the time. You can do it with silly things. Um, and I, I, for me, I mean, I mean, for those who know my work, you know, I regularly call myself an idiot, you know, um, and I do think of myself as an idiot because I have no problem saying I don't know. Can somebody who knows who's smarter than me explain this to me? I, I'm under no false illusion that I have to present myself as the smartest person in the room because I'm not, you know, and where I'm good, I might know a sliver of something, but my goodness, everything else we're talking about, I know nothing. Um, and, um, and I think being comfortable with asking for help and saying, I don't know, um, it turns out we're surrounded by people who want to take care of us and help us, but they don't because they didn't think we needed it because we were too busy presenting ourselves as perfect and having all the answers. So they just didn't. Oh. But they would yeah. if we just asked. Um, and, you know, I have, a, I have a small group of friends where, you know, we, we have a deal. And, you know, I have a couple of friends that are super senior, super high performing um, by all traditional definitions. And I remember the first time one of us called the other and said, I'm stuck. 
which is really difficult to do because you want to look smart and strong to people who you respect and they're so smart and strong. Um, and I have one of my dearest friends, he's in the military, he's a, he's a senior officer in the U.S. Air Force, he's active duty still. And uh, um, I remember the first time he called me brother, which in the military is a big deal. You know, you and I have colleagues and coworkers. They have brothers and sisters. Um, and so they call each other brother and they call each other sister. And it's an amazing thing. Um, and I remember the first time he said, all right, brother, I'll talk to you later. Or, hey, brother. And I was like, <gasps> like, that means the relationship was different now, you know. And he's a warrior. I mean, he's a he's a he's he's a hardcore. He's an amazing human being. And when we get off the phone, he'll say, I love you, you know, or he'll text me and say, I miss you. Not just miss you. I miss you, which is way more vulnerable. You know, and it's deeply human. And he and I are, you know, we call each other and say, I'm struggling or I'm stuck. And sometimes it's business. I just need your opinion. But sometimes it's personal. Sometimes it's frustration. You know, can I talk to you? I'm so freaking frustrated. Um, but to have to foster those relationships, and those relationships take a lot of work to get to. They don't just show up and they do require risk. You know, at some point you open up a little bit. But to have those kinds of friendships, I think, are absolutely essential to being what we would call a high performance human being. I don't think you can be high performance by yourself. I don't think it exists. And anybody who does is it, they're either not as high performing as they think they are or they are high performing but at tremendous cost. Um they're lonely, they need pills to start the day. Um they have other issues, they'll have health issues later in life. I think if you want to, if you choose to be quote unquote high performing by yourself, it comes at the, a cost that I think is not worth it. And can I just applaud that message? Because I think, particularly for young people now, listening to podcasts, logging onto social media sites, Instagram, all these other things, we seem to laud the self-made success story. Yeah. And everybody wants to tell us they did it on their own. Yeah. I think it's so good to hear this. Yeah. I, I heard this amazing uh, story from Steven Spielberg where he said uh, that he hears his name, he gets thank yous, like people thank him from the stage when they're receiving an Oscar that he actually doesn't know and has never helped. But the people who he's actually helped don't thank him because there's this fear that if I thank Steven Spielberg for helping me, that somehow it devalues the fact that I earned an Oscar, which of course is nonsense. It doesn't yet. But there's this deep seated insecurity that I can't thank anybody or say that I got any help, that I'm the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the, look how great I am. Yeah. And the reality is there's not a single person in the world made it without advice from someone, a favor from someone, a door open from someone, advice from someone, um, a shoulder to cry on from mm -hmm. someone, yeah. someone to vent to, you but know, at the end the of a difficult day, that, anybody. Well, maybe negative, like even, I don't know, people that cause problems yeah. in your life, bullies at school, like, yeah. they're all collaborators. They're all collaborators. Because they've built your resilience, yeah. your understanding of human nature. And like, the, nothing's a solo journey in this world. And to thank people who really did thank you is, I think, humble. Yeah. Right? And anybody who presents themselves like they're the lone wolf that uh, triumphed and won these awards and achieved this wealth and power and fortune or whatever it is, the joke is, we know you're lying. <laughs> if you're a human being, I know you're a liar, right? So why not just come clean and I'll actually think really highly of you? There'll be people listening to this now <laughs> that think, man, this guy's got it together. He understands himself. He understands the world. He understands business, understands leadership. When you found your why... Yeah. Does it take away the doubt and the fear and the, the bad days and the insecurities? No, of course not. Um, it helps me understand the times when things went well, why they went well. It helps me understand the times that things went badly, why they went badly. And it helps me make choices so that I put myself in a position of strength more often than not. Right? So, for example, I am... I hate the conversation about strengths and weaknesses. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? I think it's a stupid conversation because everything requires context, right? You don't have strengths or weaknesses. You have characteristics and attributes. And in the right context, those things are strengths. And in the wrong context, the wrong environment, those things are weaknesses. Always, right? So it's better to know who you are and then look for the environments in which those things will be advantages. So, for example, if somebody came to me and said, Simon, your work's amazing. Um, we're going to offer you 10 million pounds to do whatever work for us. And we're going to lock you in a room by yourself for three weeks and, and let you get at it. Right now, superficially, most people would be like, amazing. 
But I know that if I say yes to that deal, one of two things is absolutely going to happen. One, I suck at working by myself, right? I know this. This is an attribute. I may, I like being on a team. It is an attribute, not a strength, not a weakness, an attribute. So if you make me work by myself, one of two things is absolutely going to happen. The quality will suck. So I'll give you work and they go, wait, no, we didn't pay for this, right? Or the stress that it's going to take me to get some sort of decent product will be absolutely, it'll destroy my health and myself and everything, right? It, the stress is just tremendous. So when I get offered, you know, if anybody's listening, I, I would accept this offer, but the, you know, uh, if anybody ever came to me with that offer, I would say, thank you, but I would like a team of people, please, that I get to choose. And you can lock the team in the room for three weeks and we'll come up with the product. Because now I'm taking my attribute and I'm putting myself in a position of strength. And so one of the things that when I learned my why and I learned my how is it helped me better navigate and create the environments that make, it, that make me more likely to be in a position of strength than not. That's all it is. And if I couldn't make it work, at least I went in with eyes wide open going, this is going to suck. But at least I'm going to do it for a short period of time. And I think the cost is worth it. Right. Um, Because I always weigh the cost of everything. Everything comes at a cost. there's There's a cost for the money you make. There's a cost for your career. There's a cost for your relationships. And the, the, there's nothing wrong with that, just like there's a cost to buy a cup of coffee, right? The question is, was the cost worth it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, was this coffee worth five pounds, right? If the answer is yes, spend it. If the answer is no, find somewhere else to spend it or look for something cheaper. Okay. And so I always weigh the cost and say, is it worth the cost? And if the answer is yes, I'll do it. And if the answer is no, I'll, I'll, I'll work very hard not to. I mean, this is fascinating because we've done over 200 of these interviews, Simon, where we often come back to the teaching of Howard Gardner, the educational psychologist that mm-hmm. has that great line of don't ask people how clever they are. Instead, ask them how are they clever. And a really good example of that was when we interviewed Jo Malone. Mm-hmm. She She's a perfumier. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. She spoke about how in the school environment, she came from a broken home, so she was working extra jobs over evening and weekends. She was dyslexic. It hadn't been diagnosed. So in the school environment, when she was yawning because she'd been working the night before, she was diagnosed as being lazy. Mm. When she couldn't understand the words, she was diagnosed as being stupid. Mm-hmm. And she said it was when she took herself outside of that environment mm-hmm. that she realized she had this amazing ability to take ingredients and mm-hmm. create beautiful smells. So we're seeing this pattern mm. remarkably frequently amongst our high performers that you're describing. I'm interested in how, again, our listeners could could identify their characteristics and their attributes so that they can put themselves in environments where they thrive. Um, I mean, you have to be honest with yourself as, as one, which is, you know, you don't have to beat yourself up, but you don't have to rationalize and make sure that everything's good, which is most people have some sense of it self-awareness you know you know do you work better by yourself or on a team you can answer that one you know do you work better under stress or do you need like time you know are you the kind of person who you know you get good grades but you need to study a lot or your grades are fine but you didn't study that much like i always believe grades should be ratios you know, it's like the the, the the grade achieved over number of hours studied. Right. You know? Okay. So good. if you need a first and you're willing to give yeah. someone 50 hours, that's your person. But if you're willing to sacrifice quality a little bit, but you need it done in an hour, yeah. I got somebody else for you over here. Not better or worse. Different. Different yeah. Right? And I think what we have done is we falsely assume, assume that high levels of achievement is the most important. So if you get the top grades, it means you're the smartest in the room. But again, not if it took you 50 hours and I need somebody who can work under pressure. Yeah. Right. So most of us kind of know that. Like, how do you learn? Can you skip class and just do all the reading and you'll do well on the test? Or do you have to go to class because you have to hear it? Like, are you an oral learner or are you a a visual learner? You know, Um, how do you take notes? You know, all of the, I think anybody who's a little bit introspective can figure out where they did well. Like I, I cannot go and I'm, I have ADHD. So reading is pointless to me. Right. Right. In one year and out the other. And you're just like, it, it's literally pointless. And so I still have to pass school. And so I'm a great believer that the solutions we find to the struggles we have as children become our strengths as adults. So I'm at school with ADHD. I can't read. I mean, I can physically read. I just don't comprehend. And had it been diagnosed? No, no, no. I didn't get diagnosed until an adult. And so many similar things, you know, hyperactive kid who was 
accused of being selfish or or didn't care about people because I was absent-minded. I forgot a lot of things that I was supposed to remember. Um, and if if you believe a lot of that stuff, it'll destroy your self-worth. Um, and there were definitely moments where that happened. You know, I'm like, oh my God, I'm a selfish, horrible human being, you know? Um, um, but, uh, but thank goodness it wasn't diagnosed because even though there were difficulties that came with it and there was definitely struggle, um, I... The, the hacks that I figured out because I had to pass school was I had to go to class, couldn't skip class. I needed really good teachers who were good at explaining things. I couldn't have them teach from a book because I, because I had to enjoy myself in class. Um, I, uh, had to go after class and talk to the teacher because the conversation helped me learn. And then I did fine, you know? And so I got really good at asking questions. And I got really good at listening. Well, look what I do for a living, right? Um, so all of those skills were formed. And so why am I good at connecting patterns like I did with you and, you know, with just a couple of examples? Well, that comes from my childhood because I had to pass the test. So I needed to get as much information from as, as short a period of time as I could because I got to figure this stuff out. Like, doesn't make me smarter. It just means I figured out a life hack. And I think, you know, in this modern day and age, we're so afraid of our kids being in positions of discomfort that we're removing all the struggle you know, we're putting them on big pillows and saying, let me make this as easy as possible for you. Now, of course, every parent wants to make life easy. But if you talk to the, quote unquote, high performing people in the world, I mean, there's that very famous story about Richard Branson, you know, where his mum would drop him off three miles from home and say, see you at home. And he'd have to figure out how to get home. And she would always tell the funny story how this, whatever it was, you know, a half an hour, 20 minute walk would take him three hours because he kept stopping to like look at all the flowers and look at all the bugs. And, and now you understand a guy with a tremendous ability to solve problems and with insatiable curiosity. Well, duh, you know, like go look at how he was raised. Um, and, um, and you talked about it in you know, the bully at school, like, you know, adversity is, is the best teacher in the world. Um, and if we over coddle and oversimplify and, 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 um, then we're not allowing, people to learn who they are, what they're made of. And I'm not just talking grit. That's too obvious. I'm literally mean like the thing that makes you, you. Yeah. And every single one of us, you talk to anybody who's what we, you know, the world would consider high performing, um, assuming that they're healthy, you know, um, they, they all overcame something. Every one of them, you know, Elon Musk was horribly bullied, you know, um, there's lots and lots of stories of ADHD and dyslexia and, you know, tons of those yep. in the entrepreneurial world, um, especially. We've had many on this podcast, you know, yeah. people who've suffered huge physical yeah. injuries or childhood traumas and this sort of sense of, you know, post-traumatic growth yeah. is very common in yeah. the conversations that we have. And again, that's perspective, right? Yeah. Um, everyone will go through stress. Everyone will go through trauma, 100%. Um, and trauma will have side effects. Um, but it also, you know, I believe the world is balanced. I believe the world is always balanced. Yes, there are costs, but there's also benefits. And so if you go through trauma, yes, there will be costs and there's also benefits. You know, go back and look at COVID and say, and every, you know, when people talk about lockdown and, oh, this is what happened and how awful it was and this is what, and now ask yourself, and what was good? And I bet you can come up with an equal number because it's always balanced. Yeah. The question is, are you looking for it? And, you know, I guess maybe because of, you know, just, natural disposition or just learn who knows but i my natural disposition is to is to look for the benefits i acknowledge the costs but i look for the benefits can we please talk about leadership you reeled off a few names yep. about half an hour ago why why were those names in your mind why are those considered good leaders by you um all of them um outlived their own lives um, um, meaning that we've forgotten a lot of the people who may have accomplished great things along the way, but for some reason we remember them. And they weren't the only ones doing it. They weren't the ones leading their organizations or their movements. They certainly weren't the first, but there was something about them that sort of inspired people to believe in something bigger than themselves. I mean, when Steve Jobs dies, here's a multi-billionaire who lives a lifestyle that none of us can relate to. And we laid flowers at an apple shop after he died what right that's ridiculous 
But the only reason we did that is because for some reason we connected with what he stood for. He made us, he made a certain group of people feel seen and heard in a way that others didn't. And his, the fact that he ran a tech company, that was what he did. But why he did it was something quite different. There's a reason why young people and creative people are attracted to that because he was, he was a rebel. He was an iconoclast. He stood against the status quo. You know, he and Steve Wozniak. Um, and that's what creative people and young people like to do. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's not an accident. Um, so yeah, all of them outlived their, uh, you know, sort of lived lives that, that, that lived on beyond them. Yeah. So how, how can we, and by the way, by the way, just as an aside, every one of us has a, a deceased grandparent, a friend who has passed, who we continue to invoke their names to this day. Yeah. And so you don't have to have led a big company or a social movement to have had an impact on people's lives where they will literally tell your story and carry your name for the rest of your life. You know, my grandfather was extremely important to me. Um, and, you know, his name shows up in funny places. You know, I use his name as passwords and, you know, things like that. So why was he so significant for you then? So he, he was a, he was, he was completely unique. I mean, he was a complete weirdo and he sort of, very few people got him, but I saw a side of him and he, he sort of opened up to me in a way that he didn't open up to other people. And he basically showed me that you have permission to be your own weirdo self even if other people won't get you. How did he do that? He he just didn't give a shit what people thought about him. He just cared zero. You know? I remember I was a little kid and there was a politician on TV saying something or other. And my grandfather just sort of, we were watching the news, you know? And my grandfather goes, I'm not voting for him. And I said, you don't like his policies? And my grandfather says, I don't like his hair. I said, you can't not vote for somebody because you don't like their hair. And he said, I cannot vote for somebody for any reason I want. And I was like... Yeah, I guess. <laughs> and he just he just did his own thing. And you know, he didn't he wasn't the most some people loved him and some people didn't, and he definitely drove my grandmother nuts. But he just did it his way. Do you care what people think of you? I care. So I made a deal with myself a long time ago that um if somebody doesn't like me because basically if you want to achieve anything in this world, you have to get used to the idea that not everybody's going to like you. Like you just have to get used to that. And if you want everybody to like you and that's inconsistent with making an impact of any sorts. It just doesn't work that way. Um, but I made a deal with myself that if people didn't like me because they disagreed with me, I was okay with that. And if people didn't like me because they were intimidated by something I said or did, or I was okay with that. But if somebody that I respected didn't like me, I have a problem. And that I have to take accountability for, and I'm doing something wrong. And that's sort of the deal I made with myself. And so that, that, that goes to this day, you know, like, so if I go, I have friends who won't read the reviews of their books. I won't read them. And I always, I go read them because I find it, because yeah. if they're helpful, I want to know. Yeah. So if there's a critical review that explains in a really neat, n nicely organized way that where one of the things I wrote faltered, it didn't work. I actually like, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point they're making. I'll, I'll take that one. You know, whereas somebody just calls me an idiot or a Neanderthal, like somebody literally called me an idiot. I'm like, what am I? That's kind of like, what am I supposed to do with that? Like, this is the worst book I've ever read. I'm like, okay, compared to what? Like, I don't know. That's not helpful to me. <laughs> yeah. Give me something helpful. You know, um, so bad reviews or bad criticism, like again, it's if it's helpful, I really welcome it. But if you're just throwing stones, I don't. I actually don't know what to do with it. Yeah. So tell us the best piece of feedback you've had then. If we talk about you as a writer, so yeah. we get specific. <laughs> Because your work is in vote, um and and will outlive you. Yeah, you know, Thank you. The, like the impact is significant nice. across across the uh, the globe. So mm. I'm interested. How did you get there, and what was the kind of what was the best piece of feedback that's allowed you to be able to write so succinctly and powerfully? So when I wrote my first book, nobody thought I could write, including me. The longest thing I'd ever wrote prior was like 15, 20 pages, you know, a paper for school. That is brilliant for people to hear, though, because I think people see someone like you and think, oh, I must have been incredible from the age of 11, writing all sorts of amazing no, things. Like, no, no. I think that's so powerful. No, I think, like, if I'm really honest with myself, probably the longest thing I wrote was 10 pages, because <laughs> if it was 30, it was probably shite. So where um, did the courage come from then to even begin or to think, I'm going to write a book? It's not really courage. It's, it's, 
I had this idea and a friend of mine said you should really write this down and I was like oh, okay you know and somebody made an introduction um, to uh, and again when I say somebody it's not because I was well connected it's because I believed in starting with why and I was really good at it and I believed in the law of diffusion of innate innovations which is I only talk to early adopters and so the right people always made introductions for me I was dogged about only talking to early adopters so I basically the my blueprint for actually how my career went and how I built Start With Why is written in Start With Why. Like that is literally what I did. Right. And I didn't have advertising or PR firms. I didn't game the algorithms. I didn't drive any numbers on, I didn't have friends write fake reviews. Like none of, did none of that. All the tricks in, of the trade, I didn't do any of them. Um, I followed, th that book is my blueprint. I just wrote what I did. Um, and so somebody introduced me um, to one of the great business publishers and um, you know um and i had a 29 minute meeting with him and he three days later they offered me a book deal he just took a risk on me um again starting with why you connect with the right people for some reason they take risks yeah they don't know why either you know um um and then they uh told me i should get a writer and so m my agent at the time introduced me to a guy he knew and said this is the perfect writer for you and I went out to Portland to meet him, and I brought the contract. And these contracts always say, you know, whatever the numbers are, 25% up front, 25% upon delivery, whatever they are, you know, 50% up front, whatever it is. And the way that really works in practice is you sign the paper, and like freaking three months later, they send you a check, right? Yeah. And, I, and I went, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a nobody. I got no following. I got no nothing. But I, 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 it said upon signing 50%, so I... We signed the contract ceremonially at his house in Portland. This was about a weekend to work together, and I handed him a check for the first for the first half. And the first thing we did was get in his car and drive to the bank to cash it, which was a little weird, <laughs> you know. And then he kept trying to challenge my ideas and change my ideas, and I was like, "Oh my God, this guy wants to write his own book, not help me write my book." And he was very difficult, and sort of kept shooting down my ideas. And remember, when I wrote Start With Why, I'd already been out there talking about it for two and a half years. Like, yeah. I like I knew my stuff. And uh, I went back to my hotel room that night, and I'm like, this is not going to work. And I called him up, and I fired him. I said, listen, hey, I think I don't think you and I are a good connection. And he started screaming and yelling at me. I will mention that before I called him, I called the bank and stopped the check. Of course. course. Yeah. And I told him that. I said, just so you know, I've stopped the check. You know, And he started screaming, yelling at me, and threatening to sue me, and all of this stuff. And the good news is all contracts, if you haven't done anything, there's no damage done. He, I'm not in breach because he hasn't, he hasn't done anything yet, mm. you know? All contracts have a little cooling off period. And uh, and so I said, I explained to him, I'm like, you know, your threat, A, the way you're responding, you just made life a lot easier for me. Uh, you've reinforced my decision. If you were a gentleman about it, I'd really start questioning if I'd made the right choice here. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and I moved on. And of course, he didn't sue me. Um but now the problem was I had a book to write. <laughs> and so it's kind of amazing what a deadline will do <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when a company gives you a ton of money and says, <laughs> you owe us. And um, I started writing, but I started writing the way I speak. And so the book is very conversational. It's a very easy book to read. Yep. Um, I don't use big words because then I, I don't, I'm not trying to make myself look or sound smart. I'm really just trying to, and because I have ADHD, I don't like reading books, and I actually don't read a lot of... Everybody thinks I'm really well-read, and I like to joke that I've actually written more books than I've read, which is true. <laughs> um, and so the great thing about being the writer is if I'm reading my own work and I'm bored out of my skull, I just cross it out. And so if you notice in those books, they're pretty short sections, and yeah, yeah. they're pretty punchy, and there's a lot of stories, because I had to enjoy reading it, too. So I wrote a book that I enjoyed reading. Uh, for somebody with ADHD. Um, so I, I I, it, there's no simple answer to your question, but I didn't try and write to a standard of other people. Yeah. I tried to write a book that I wanted to read, and it turns out it's a really nice, simple, sweet little book, which is what I like. <laughs> well, then, as you've gone on and, and, and done your other successful yeah. books, you must have had feedback that then people, like, people then... It, well, it's that old saying, isn't it, that failure is often born an orphan, but success has got many fathers. Yeah. So lots of people then must want to offer an insight or yeah. a comment or a critique. I don't show my work to anybody except about one person. Who's that? So my friend Jen Hallam, 
uh, she's been with me for years. Um, uh, I, I did have somebody help me write and research named, named uh, Lori Flynn for Start With Why. Um, and she was a New York Times because I realized I didn't want a writer. I needed a journalist because I needed help with the research. And she would write a couple of the sections like as a journalist, and I would go write it as a. As okay. a but I wrote 80% of Start With Why. I wrote 90% of Leaders Eat Last, and I wrote 100% of, uh, of Infinite Game. Um, uh, but Jen um, was with me uh, for the for Leaders Eat Last and Infinite Game, and she's I've just known her for years. She doesn't work for the publisher. She actually is not an editor by trade. She just happens to be a brilliant, brilliant editor and one of a, and my dear friend. And she just calls shit all the time on stuff I'm writing. And says it doesn't make sense. She's the only person I trust. Um, so I do I don't do any of my stuff alone ever. Um, but I work with the people that I want to work with, and it's usually one person. I don't give my manuscript to ten people and yeah. say, "What do you think?" Um, so tell us about Jen then, in terms of, because yeah. that really intrigued me, that relationship of, like, you spoke about that small word with big implications of trust. Yeah. What what one piece of feedback has she offered you, Simon, where you've gone, wow, that's an insight, oh, that's incredibly valuable? She, you know, Jen has a, a mind, like, I've. it's the most incredible mind. It's really funny because... I think it's okay if I say this, you know, she is diagnosed with OCD, not like, oh, I'm obsessive. Like, no, no, she's diagnosed. Like she has OCD. She takes her meds. You know, I have ADHD. I sometimes take my meds, you know, and we are total opposite, you know, like the things that relax her freak me out and things that relax me freak her out. It's kind of really funny. Um, uh, and she is fastidious for logic and I'm really good at the big, big ideas and so she will track the logic of an idea from the beginning to the middle to the end of the book where by the end I've forgotten what it says at the beginning. Um, and so her ability to keep track of everything and make sure that I haven't abandoned the logic from beginning to end yeah. is yeah, I couldn't do that without her because uh, I can't remember 250 pages. She can. It freaks me out. She sounds very useful because she brings that incredible skill to your writing. Yeah. But how do you choose the people around you like how do you choose the people that you let in because you will live a life you're very well known there'll be many people who want to be i'll be friends with simon i can talk about my why every day hmm. i imagine that's very attractive to a lot of people so how do you choose the people in your circle i mean i don't think i don't think it's particularly unique and i don't think it's any different than anybody else like how do you choose your friends how do you choose your friends like I like I make friends like anybody else. You like I meet somebody. Sometimes you're introduced to them. Sometimes you meet them somewhere. You get along. You have a nice conversation. You sort of like each other. You go out once. You like each other again, or you don't, and you never talk to each other again. You know, you both let your guards down a little bit. You both end up a little bit. You realize you've got a lot of you shared values. I mean, my friends are the same as everybody else's yeah. friends. You know, um, I, there's no. I don't think there's. I mean, one of the things that I do notice about people, you know, um, who sort of had some sort of commercial success especially the ones who had it young is their guards go up because they live lives. I mean, I had an experience where somebody gave me incredibly bad advice that hurt me. And it was somebody in the inner circle, uh, who I work with a work colleague who gave me incredibly bad advice that turned out was advice that was serving them, but not me. And it was self-serving advice they gave me that was very costly for me. It was very hurtful and painful. And I called up my, fr I called up a friend of mine who's, been in the public eye since like 20 years old he's like 60 now you know um and i said how do i deal with this like how do you deal with it he's like yeah he says you're a product now like get used to it this is like it never goes away like you're going to live a life where you're not a hundred percent sure and it's like i understand why celebrities marry celebrities you know i kind of get it yeah um um because when you start to meet people, and I've gotten burned. That's, by the way, one of the things that where Leaders Eat Last come from, came from, which is, yeah, you know, everybody knows this. When you achieve any kind of commercial success whatsoever, all your jokes are funnier and you're much better looking, right? It's just what happens. Yeah. And if you believe it, you're, you're, you're dead. If you believe your own press and you believe what, all the smoke that people blow, you know, up your ass, then you're, it's a short, it's going to be a short existence. Yeah. But if you, I mean, there's a story that I've told before that, is, that I live by. It's a former undersecretary of defense who was uh, giving a speech at a big conference, a um, thousand people or something. And while he's standing on the stage giving his prepared remarks, he stops and interrupts himself and smiles and says, you know, last year 
I spoke at this exact same conference in last year. I was still the undersecretary. Last year, they flew me here, business class. There was somebody waiting for me at the airport to take me to the hotel. Somebody had already checked me in when I got to the hotel. I came down in the morning. There was somebody else waiting in the lobby to take me in another car to this same venue. They took me in the back entrance. They took me into a green room, and somebody offered me a cup of coffee in a beautiful ceramic cup. He says, this morning, uh, he says, he, I flew here coach this time. He says, I checked myself into the hotel. Uh, this morning I came down and I took a taxi to the same venue. I came in the front door. I find my way backstage. Um, and when I said to somebody, do you have any coffee? They pointed to the coffee machine in the corner and I poured myself a cup of coffee into this here styrofoam cup. He says, the ceramic cup was never meant for me. It was meant for the position I held. I deserve a styrofoam cup. And I think every successful person on the planet um, is given ceramic cups. You know, they hold doors open for you. They give you perks. They give you free products. You know, whatever it is. Then they tell you you're beautiful and they tell you you're funny and they tell you you're smart and you feel great. And it's no problem. Enjoy it. Be grateful for it. It's definitely fun. It's definitely surreal. But they're not giving it to you. They're giving it to the position that you currently occupy. They're giving it and then the next person, they'll give it to them. And there's a guy I know who's a big CEO who retired recently. And there's a big fancy party that was being thrown. This is a true story. It was a big fancy party. And he was talking to a friend of his. He was like, hey, did you get your invitation? And the guy goes, yeah. He goes, I didn't get mine. He must have gotten lost. He didn't realize that they were never inviting him to the party all these years. They were inviting the CEO of this company that happened to be him. Yep. He completely missed the plot. And so, like I said, enjoy the perks, but they're mm -hmm. not meant for you. And I think the people that think it, that they deserve the ceramic cup, they've missed, they've missed the plot. We all deserve styrofoam cups. But is that, when that happens in your life, yeah. does knowing your why become ever more important because it's something to keep you grounded and keep you coming back it, to it, like a, there's, there's, there's a combination of things. I think yeah. definitely knowing your why is a part of it. Definitely surrounding yourself with people who call you, who tell you you're an idiot is important. You know, my sister is the first person to be like, get over yourself, you know? That's true. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I can't get away with anything, you know, which is correct, you know. Um, she's known me her whole life. Um, I'm older, so I've got a couple of years on her. Um, uh, but I think the other part is the way I view career, which is, in, and this is the importance of vision and, and cause, which is, you know, when I got started and I said, wouldn't this be amazing if work worked like this, you know? And people were like, I think you're completely unrealistic. And I'm like, no, no. I think I have an idea and an idea is an iceberg beneath the ocean, which is you're the only one who can see it. That's literally what an idea or a vision is. It's a figment of your imagination. And if you do some work that brings that idea, some tangibility, some life, I gave a talk, I wrote a book, whatever it was, I did some consulting, whatever it was, it just added a little bit of tangibility. That's like a little bit of iceberg popping up. So there are a few people who be like, oh, I see what you're, what you're talking about now. And so throughout my whole career, somebody would be like, hey, nice job. I'd be like, tip of the iceberg. And then as my career progressed, you know, m more did more things, more iceberg, and people are like, ah, oh, it's amazing what you've achieved. They're only looking above the ocean. Yeah. I'm still looking beneath the ocean. And I would always go, oh, tip of the iceberg. And to this day, if you, if you, no matter what compliments you'll pay me, I'll be grateful and I'll say thank you. But what's going through my mind is tip of the iceberg. And so I'm, 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 I, I'm humbled by the tremendous amount of work that is still yet to be done. And what, what reminds me of, you know, what keeps me going is sort of like the, the original founders of the women's suffrage movement in the United States, every single one of them had died of natural causes before the, before the first woman voted. Right now, I'm sure they would have loved to have lived to see a woman vote, but I can guarantee you that they died proud and with smiles on their faces, knowing that they built a momentum that other people could see what they imagined beneath the, the ocean and yeah. would carry the torch without them. And that's sort of what I live for. I live for, I live for the desire to spread a message in a way that I can die with confidence that other people will carry the torch without me. And, you know, I look at somebody like Oprah and I, as remarkable as she is, and she put her face on every cover of every magazine. The magazine is named after her, 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 everything is named after her and she's on. The, and if she dies, it dies. I mean, a, a remarkable human being who's done remarkable good in the world, but it's her. Yeah. And I've worked very hard to make it not about me. You know, we changed our company from, you know, to the optimism company. And, you know, we remind our team that, you know, you're, they're optimists. 
that's what they are that we call our team optimists and like i i every year you know i don't think we're 100% there yet but every year the goal is that that if i were to get hit by a bus i can i can say with pride that the work will continue because it has to because it must because the vision is bigger than all of us so um, wouldn't say that's an opt- op- an optimistic way to finish talking about getting <laughs> hit by a bus <laughs> But I think it's it is a brilliant optimistic way to, <laughs> yes, but to know that the maybe momentum will carry Correct. without me. That's great. I love that. And it will. Um, we could talk for hours. Would you come back sometime? I'd be honoured. Thank you. It was really interesting. Thank before, you. Before we let you go, though, mm. we have a few quick fire questions we'd like to run by you. Okay. Chocolate. Oh, sorry, you haven't started yet. <laughs> it's correct answer. Off you go. Uh, <laughs> the three non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you should buy into. Um, uh, integrity. Uh, uh, honor, not the same thing. Um, Explain and that one, sorry. When sure. You say honor. Um, so honor is a word that still exists in the military, that seems to have fallen away in polite society. You know, chivalry is gone. You know, there was a time where your word was it, and you wouldn't violate your word because then if people knew that you violated your word, no one would want to do business with right. you, right? Like, it really, honor mattered. I love that. And I'll give you an example. You know, for me, what honor has nothing to do with reliability or intelligence or even honesty. You can have people who are honest and reliable and not and dishonorable. They're, I mean, honest and, and reliable, but dishonorable. O- dishonor for me, or honor, is doing something that's dishonorable is um, taking advantage of somebody else's bad situation for personal gain. That's dishonorable. And if you're willing to put aside your own interests, ego, ambition because somebody else is struggling then that's that to me is honorable and this happens all the time like when a company is struggling that an employee walks into their bus and say I want my raise now like now? that's when you're going to ask? because somebody told you you have leverage or you have the cards it's dishonorable I want them out I don't care how much more I'm going to have to suffer I want them out Whereas if they knuckle down and help us get through the really, really hard times and then come and say, listen, I was there with you through all the hard times. I'd, I'd really think I'm in, I'd like a little more. I'd be like, yeah, cool. Let's have that conversation. But doing it when someone is struggling, I think is dishonorable. So for me, honor is a is really big. So integrity, you know, doing the right thing, high ethical standards, um, honor, and uh, and I think willingness to take yourself on is the third one. Um it's very difficult being a human being. You know, cats don't have to work very hard to be cats, but humans have to work very hard to be humans. And the people who are on my team, every new team member when they join our team, I like how this was supposed to be quick fire. Um, um, every new member of our team gets a phone call from me and says, A, you're part of something bigger than yourself. Always remember that. And B, I have one expectation of you. Whether you stay with, stay with this company for a short term or a long term, um, I expect you to leave here a better version of yourself than when you started. I expect you to take yourself on. We'll give you some of that education and some of it I expect you to seek out by yourself. But you've got to take yourself on. And I think that's a non-negotiable. If you could go back to one moment in your life, what would it be and why? Um, I, I, it's, a, it's a very difficult question because I think now is the best time to be. Um, I'm grateful for all the experiences I had, good and bad, throughout my life, but I don't really want to go and relive any of them. Um, so I, I don't actually know how to answer the question. If you could give one piece of advice to a young Simon, <laughs> what would you say? Um, you don't have to know every answer and you don't have to pretend you do. I, w- I wish I learned that lesson earlier. Mm, I bet. What's the most valuable piece of advice you've ever received? Um, uh, I mean, the most valuable, I, I, I don't know, but I can give you one or two very valuables. Um, you know, you know, get over yourself. You know, when I'm complaining about something or, and somebody leans over and just get over yourself. Like that's your sister. I, yeah. I, I think that is, and sometimes I'll catch myself doing it to myself. Like, you know, I'm whining about something. I'm like, get over yourself. You know, I think that's, that's way up there. Um, another one that I got that I live by, <laughs> I was young, young, young in a big company and the senior client came in and my job was, I got to be in the senior meeting with all the senior people from my company and the senior people from the client. And my job was to work the PowerPoint. Like, that was my job. And, like, I just had to make it go next. 
But I worked on the account every day, so sometimes they were talking about something, and because I was in the weeds and they weren't, I would offer up some answers. Not because I was trying to impress anybody, it's just because I actually knew what was going on and they didn't. And at the end of the meeting, <laughs> this woman who was like my work mom, she was one of the senior partners of the company, she put her arm around me as we walked out the door, and she looked at me and she goes, you know, three quarters of an answer is better than an answer and a half. And that has stuck with me to this day. Like when I'm sitting in meetings and I could offer more and I, I just don't. Three quarters of an ounce is better than an ounce and a half. Love that. <laughs> For people listening to this who feel content and happy yeah. and okay and stable, but they don't know their why, yeah. what would you say to them? Um, well, you could do the friends exercise, which is really fun. Um, and it's a really fun way to do it. And, you know, I, I've tried to produce resources to help people in what suits them. So the friends exercise is one way you can do it. Um, I wrote a book called Find Your Why, which if you want to go through a workbook, we have ways to do it. If you go to simonsinek.com, there is, so you can have one-on-one -on -one somebody help you. You can take a course. You can do it with a group. I've tried to do it in as many ways as possible because I want everybody to learn their why. And so I've tried to do it as in all the different ways, whatever works. But yeah, do one of them. Great. Yeah. And the final question, Simon, is what's your one golden rule for anyone seeking to live a high-performance life? Um, uh, it's the golden rule is, um, it has to be for the benefit of others. Um, um, high performance for the benefit of yourself. I don't really know what that means because at some point, you know, I want to make a million pounds. I'll make 2 million pounds. Like you're going to keep just moving the goal lines and it'll feel like a, a, a treadmill at some point. It's you, you're going to, you're going to crash. It's going to happen. Um, but when you live a high performance life for the benefit of others, it's it's infinite. You can do it forever and it's rewarding until the day you die.